things out. You're working all things out. Yes, I will lift you high in the lowest valley. Yes, I will bless your offering right now and we have a testimony but but I have to cough (laughs) okay so um, we bought our house a year ago and we escrow our taxes and insurance Um, and it's our taxes are a lot at least we we thought they were a lot but we got a check in the mail yesterday for an overpayment, and we've gotten those before, and sometimes they were like, what, $100, maybe 75 not a lot. We got a $2,000 overage check. I was like, wow. I mean, we, we have expenses coming up in a couple weeks, 
And I was like, that's awesome. Our kids need some dental work. And we were like, that's awesome. So, and we actually, that night before we were praying and I said, Lord, I ask you to provide the finances for Isabella needs some dental work. For Isabella, Lord, I know you're well able to do it. I mean, you care about everything. And then that next day, we got a check in the mail. So God's faithful, right? Amen. So I just want to, I thank God. I believe it's because we're faithful tithers. I always would say, every day we get the mail, there's a check in there for me. And sometimes there is by faith, right? Amen. So Father, we are thankful for your goodness, for your provision, that you're always watching out, Lord, that you give us what, what we need, even, Lord, what we want, our, our desires. I thank you, Father God, that you care about everything, Lord. We thank you for this opportunity to give. I thank you, Jesus, that each person has something that they can offer to you, Father. You've done so much for us, Lord. You've been so faithful for all of us in this room, Father. The least we can do is bring an offering, Jesus. I thank you, Father. Multiply it in Jesus' name. Amen. Humbly I stand and offer with open hands, Lord, I breathe. Lord, take control.
laid on me for 44 years and I 
have accumulated something from each of those ministers who laid hands on me. And so what I want to do with my wife is I want to impart that. And it's multifaceted. I'm probably not going to prophesy. You're not going to fall down. We are going to do some kingdom business. So if, if, I don't want you coming up here flippantly. If you want to partake of 44 years of anointing that's been put on us, come up quickly. We'll lay hands on you. I do want to say something first, and I have to repent because I was supposed to say this Sunday when we sang the song, and I didn't. You know, we talk about giving God our best. God doesn't only want our best. He wants every hurt, every broken heart, everything that holds you back. He wants you to surrender to him now. Come to him and just give it all to him because he loves you. That's right. That's right. I bear witness with that. So, um, people online, I don't know what you're going to do, but for the people in this house, we're going to do some kingdom business, okay? So, uh, and that can mean we'll lay hands on anybody, and that includes you, Bob, and Bill, and, and uh, Caleb, but let's just do this. We'll do it orderly, we'll do it decent and in order, and we'll get this done. Oh, okay. So as we lay hands on you and we move on, just go ahead and, and return to your seat and sit down and worship God, okay? Thank you, Lord God. Blessings to you in the name of Jesus. I am part of that which I have received. Freely I have received, freely I give. Blessings and honor to you. We impart to you. <laughs> we impart it to you. I don't know what it is, but you're getting something. So just receive and simply with a childlike faith. That's what gets things done. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for doing a work in this man's life and in his family. We release that which has been sown into us into him right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, she is never going to be the same. Impartation to you in Jesus' name, sweetheart. Impartation to you, my brother, in the name of Jesus. Receive that which you've been crying out for in Jesus' name. Father, in the name of Jesus, handmaiden of the Lord, servant of the Lord, we impart to you that which has been given unto us in Jesus' name. Father, in the name of Jesus, strong anointing pulling upon you in Jesus' name. It's not only going in, Matthew, it's coming out. And in Jesus' name, it's to you, your family, all of the kids, Adam, Abigail, Jonah, Levi, wherever you're at, in Jesus' name. Jen, you are a psalmist in Jesus' name. Support and help those that you help in Jesus' name. You will never be the same. In Jesus' name, Lila. Lila. <laughs> I say your name wrong, but I know you, and, and you are a handmaiden. Special pick for what you're doing. In Jesus' name. Receive the anointing, sister. Receive the anointing in Jesus' name. Connect with it. In the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. Oh, yeah. Jesus' name. Whatever went into her, I tell you, it's great. Father, in the name of Jesus, we receive together with her. We know that she is anointed of the Lord. We just put our faith with her. 44 years of it. We release it inside of her in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah, buddy. You're a good guy. In Jesus' name, receive. 
in Jesus' name, receive. In Jesus' name. Sister, look. turn you around and change you. I know that. Ben, Jesus' name, you are the blessed of the Lord. You are going to serve God with all of your heart. And we now release an anointing in you. We don't know what it is, but God will tell you what it is. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, we receive into this family. We release into this family anointings upon anointings in Jesus name in Jesus name in Jesus name it is not over yet. you watch and see you want that okay in Jesus name I release a special anointing upon you you are going to read and study the word it's going to come alive in you and you'll be able to give it to others in Jesus name In Jesus' name, sister, blessings to you. Forty years of anointing on you. In the name of Jesus, forty years plus go it flow into into her. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Lay hands on your husband when you get home. try to hinder, hurt, or harm you. In Jesus' name, I decree strength for your heart, strength for your arms, and a witty, witty idea come to you in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, you just didn't come along for the ride. You are here by divine appointment and destiny. In Jesus' name, I release start to change you. Just relax and believe God for what he wants you to do, okay? All right? You're a good guy. In the name of Jesus, we release that anointing in added to what he already has. I thank you for the anointings that have gone before, the Bobby Walkers, the Doc Lemons, the Tracy Harrises, those who have laid hands on Brenda and I. We release more anointing that was stored up for this night in Jesus' name. <laughs> in Jesus name I'm sorry I just saw it I'm like a battery Brenda and I are like batteries and people have been charging us for years and all of a sudden it was time to release some of that in Jesus name strength for the journey strength for your back soundness of mind and joy in your heart in Jesus name So I'm going to challenge everybody to do something that I feel like the Lord talked to me about it on Sunday, but maybe it wasn't the right people or maybe the right person wasn't here. 
but I have some pens and a piece of paper up here, and I feel like if there's something that you need to just surrender, you need to come up and get a piece of paper, a pen, write it down, and lay it at the altar. We're not going to look at it. No one here cares. If you have an offense that you need to surrender, if you have an addiction that you need to surrender, if you have a habit of busyness that is taking place between you and God, you need to surrender. If you have a habit of uh, overeating, undereating, binge eating, surrender it to God. Because there's right now there's no room for anything to get between you and God. If you have bad feelings towards somebody, surrender it. That is how you become set free. It's when you take it, write it down, and release it. Amen. So if that's you, if there's something that you've been holding on to, a grudge, I'm telling you right now, now is the time to get rid of it in Jesus' name. And when you do it, you release it completely. That means you don't think about it anymore. You don't dwell on it. The hurt feelings are gone. The offense is removed. Even you children, if you have something against your brother or sister, bad attitudes, bad feelings, you release it right now. Amen? Unfair. Surrender that. You deserve my every breath. My life. My song. Everything and nothing less.
Father God, we thank you right now, Lord. I thank you, Jesus, for each person that took a step of faith and that laid down their hurts, their offenses, their struggles, their pains at your altar, Lord. I thank you, Jesus, that our children see us and they watch us, Lord, and they see us live a life for you and that they learn to surrender. It's forgiveness. I thank you, Jesus, right now that each person that they're set free, that when they try to remember, Father, you remind them. You remind them of this moment right here, of this altar, of them laying it down, that it is gone. I thank you, Jesus, for the people who laid down addictions, Father. I thank you, Jesus, that you are the power to overcome. I thank you, Lord, that we can and will overcome in you, Father, not on our own abilities, Jesus. So I thank you, Father God, for your goodness. I thank you for the obedience of each person here. I thank you, Lord, that we surrender to you. In your mighty name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You receive it tonight. Come on, let's give the Lord some love. All right, greet somebody. Kids are dismissed. We love you. This is what our lesson is going to be about tonight, is how big are you? Okay? I don't know how many of you are familiar with Gene ba Bailey. He is a pastor in Kenneth, at Kenneth Copeland Ministries. He also is a host of a, a program called Flashpoint, which I like to listen to. And he told a story one time about when he was in high school. He was a basketball player, and he was out on the court, and his team was losing really badly, and he was getting a push to, pushed around. So the coach called timeout and called him over and was very angry at him and said, Bailey, your problem is you don't know how big you are. And I thought, hmm, that's interesting. That sounds like a message. And so, do you know how big you are? 1 Samuel 16, 7 says, But the Lord said to Samuel, Don't judge by his appearance or height, for I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see things the way you see them. People judge by outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. How are you looking at things? Are you looking at things through your own eyes, or are you looking at things through God's eyes? Your vision determines your size. It sounds funny, but the way you see determines how big you are. Are you bigger than Goliath? 1 Samuel 17, 3 says, so the Philistines and the Israelites faced each other on opposite hills with the valleys between them. Then Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, came out of the Philistine ranks to, force the, to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet, and his brown coat, bronze coat of mail weighed 125 pounds. 
He also wore bronze leg armor, and he carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was as heavy and thick as a weaver's beam, tipped in an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds. His armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying a shield. Goliath was nine feet, nine inches tall. That's pretty tall. In anybody's sight, that's pretty tall. His armor weighed 125 pounds, which is more than a lot of you weigh here. His spear weighed 15 pounds. Verse 11 states that Saul and the Israelite army were dismayed and terrorized. Now remember, these are soldiers. These are trained warriors who are trained to fight the enemy and beat them. But they were looking through the eyes of fear. They saw only the size of the giant. Enter David. 1 Samuel 17, 12. Now David was the son of a man named Jesse, and if some guy from Bethlehem in the land of Judah. Jesse was an old man at that time, and he had eight sons. His three oldest sons had already joined Saul's army to fight the Philistines. Davis was the young, David was the youngest son. David's three brothers stayed with Saul's army, but David went back and forth so he could help his father with the sheep in Bethlehem. For 40 days, every morning and evening, the Philistine champion, champion strutted in front of the Israelite army. One day, Jesse said to David, take this basket of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread and carry them quickly to your brothers and give these 10 cuts of cheese to their captain. See how your brothers are getting along and bring back a report on how they are doing. David's brothers were with Saul and the Israelite army at the Valley of Elah, fighting against the Philistines. So David left the sheep with another shepherd and set out early the next morning with the gifts as Jesse had directed him. He arrived at the camp just as the Israeli army was leaving for the battlefields with shouts and battle cries. Soon the Israelite and the Philistines' forces stood facing each other, army against army. David left the, his things with the keeper of the supplies and hurried out to the ranks to greet his brothers. As he was talking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gath, came out from the Philistine ranks. Then David heard him shout his usual taunt to the army of Israel. So now we have David, 17 years old, he was the youngest of eight boys, the least in his family. I mean, he was such a least person, they sent him out to take care for the sheep, which was the lowest of all jobs. Uh, and he, but he was a composer of psalms to, David, to God. David spent his time singing and worshiping his God. David heard Goliath's taunt of the armies of Israel. In 2 Samuel 17, 8, Goliath stood and shouted a taunt across to the Israelites. Why are you all coming out to fight, he called. I am the Philistine champion, but you are only servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we'll be your slaves. But if I kill him, you'll be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. David didn't see the giant. He saw an uncircumcised Philistine. 1 Samuel 17, 26. David asked the soldier standing nearby, what will a man get for killing this Philistine and ending his defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? David saw a pagan. He saw a man who had no covenant with God. David knew his God. He knew his God was the living God. Samuel 17, 31. Then David's question, what was going to be done for a man who killed this man, was reported to Saul, and the king sent for him. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he's been a man of war since his youth. Saul told David, you can't do this. You're too young. You're not able. He's a warrior, after all. Regardless of what you're facing, people will try to discourage you. To get you to look at Goliath at his size, to get your eyes on the size of the problem or your inability in their eyes. David rehearsed to Saul what God had done through him in the past, how God had helped him. Then he told Saul what God would do to Goliath. David rehearsed what God had done through him. Samuel, 1 Samuel 17 through 34. But David persisted. I have been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. When a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. 
If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I'll do it to this pagan Philistine too, for he has defied the armies of the living God. After David put himself in remembrance of what God had done through him and the victories he'd given, then David went out to meet Goliath and told Goliath what God was going to do. David's 1 Samuel 17, 40, he picked up five smooth, smooth, mm, yeah, excuse me. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them in a shepherd's bag. Then, armed with only a shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Goliath, Goliath walked out toward David with his shield bearer ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruddy-faced boy. Am I a dog, he roared at David, that you come in with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods. Come over here and I'll give your flesh to the birds of wild animals, Goliath yelled. David replied to the Philistine, You come to me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head. And then I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals, and the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescues his people, but not with a sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. I like David's, ad David's attitude. I can just see him standing up, there, his whole attitude. Are you kidding me, Goliath? Do you know who I serve? God will help me make short work of you. And then the Bible says David ran towards Goliath. 1 Samuel 17, 48. As Goliath moved closer to attack, David quickly ran to meet him. Reaching into his shepherd's bag and taking out a stone, he hurled it with a sling and hit the Pharisee in the forehead. The stone sank in, and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone, for he had no, no sword. <clears throat> David refused to look at those things around him. He saw the same sight that the army saw, but he didn't see how big Goliath was. He didn't listen to those who told him how small he was. David looked at how big his God was. He looked at how big his God made him. He went forth in the name and the power of God. David stepped into the fight as if it was already won. In reality, Goliath was the underdog, not David. The entire battle only took two verses and one stone. The entire Israeli army stood and watched, paralyzed by fear. The lesson learned, size doesn't matter to God. David saw not the size of Goliath, but the size of his God. So, are you bigger than the giants? Numbers 13, verse 1. The Lord now said to Moses, Send out men to explore the land of Canaan, the land I am giving to the Philistines. Remember that. The land I am giving to the Philistines. Send one leader from each of the twelve ancestral tribes. So Moses did as the Lord commanded him. He sent out twelve men, all tribal leaders of Israel, from their camp in the wilderness. Verse 2 says, God said, I am giving this land to you. This was God's promise to the people. The spies that he sent out were leaders, and they knew this promise. Numbers 13, verse 17. Moses gave these men these instructions as he sent them out to explore the land. Go north through the Negev into the hill country. See what the land is like and find out whether the people living there are strong or weak, few or many. Not that that should have made any difference in the first place. See what kind of land they live in. Is it good or bad? Do their towns have walls or are they unprotected like open camps? Is the soil fertile or poor? Are there many trees? Do your best to bring back samples of the crops you see. It happened to be the season for harvesting the first ripe grapes. So they went out to explore the land. The first thing I want to know is, what kind of land did they think the Lord was going to give them that they had to go see if it was good or bad? God's not going to give them junk. So the spies went out and explored the land as Moses had instructed. And then they returned. Number 13, 25. After exploring the land for 40 days, the men returned to Moses, Aaron, and the whole community of Israel at Kadesh in the wilderness of Paran. They reported to the whole community what they had seen and showed them the fruit they had taken from the land. This was their report to Moses. We entered the land you sent us to explore, 
and it is indeed a bountiful country, a land flowing with milk and honey. Here is the kind of fruit it produces. But the people living there are powerful, and their towns are large and fortified. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. The Amalekites live in the Negev, and the Hittites, Jebusites, and Amorites live in the hill country. The Canaanites live along the coast of the Mediterranean Sea and along the Jordan Valley. So they spread this bad report about the land among the Israelites. The land we traveled through and explored will devour anyone who lives there. All the people we saw are huge. We even saw giants there, the descendants of Anak. Next to them we felt like grasshoppers, and that's what they thought too. Their report, the land does indeed flow with milk and honey. It's a good land, bountiful and fruitful. But, do you know there are some buts that are not good? This is one of those. Despite the fact that God promised to give us this land, the people there are too strong for us. The cities are fortified. The men are giants. We look like grasshoppers to them and to us as well. Now I want to know how they knew that the people thought they looked like grasshoppers. Did they stop and talk to them? Enter Caleb, Numbers 1330. But Caleb tried to quiet the people as they stood before Moses. Let's go at once and take the land, he said. We can certainly conquer it. Two of the men who had explored the land, Joshua son of Nun and Caleb son of that guy, tore their clothing. They said to all the people of Israel, the land we traveled through and explored is a wonderful land. And if the Lord is pleased with us, he will bring us safely into the land and give it to us. It is a rich land flowing with milk and honey. Do not rebel against the Lord and don't be afraid of the people of the land. They are only helpless prey to us. They have no protection, but the Lord is with us. Don't be afraid of them. Joshua, Caleb, we should go up at once and take possession. We are well able. The Lord is with us to protect us, and God has given us the land. Joshua and Caleb and the other ten spies all saw the exact same sights. They saw the same people, the same land, the same cities. But Joshua and Caleb saw it through the promise of God. They knew God had given them the land and would go with them to protect them. The other spies looked at the size of the people in the fortified cities. They looked at the natural facts and f were filled with fear. They forgot God's promise. Joshua and Caleb did not listen to the people. They didn't see how big the giants were. They looked at how big God was, at how big they were with God. <clears throat> they put their faith in God's promise to them. <clears throat> so you see, so far, what you're looking at determines how size you are. Are you bigger than a fiery furnace? Daniel 3, verse 1. King Nebuchadnezzar made a gold statue 90 feet tall and 9 feet wide and set it up on the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then he sent messengers to the high officers, officials, governors, advisors, treasurers, judges, magistrates, and all the provincial officials to come to the dedication of the statue he had set up. So all these officials came and stood before the statue King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. <clears throat> then a herald shouted out, People of all races and nations and languages, listen to the king's command. When you hear the sound of the horn, flute, zither, lyre, harp, pipes, and other musical instruments, bow to the ground to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's gold statue. Anyone who refuses to obey will immediately be, th be thrown into the blazing furnace. So at the sound of the musical instruments, all the people, whatever their race or nation or language, bow to the ground and worship the gold statue that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. The king's order, worship my statue or die. <clears throat> but God's word says in Deuteronomy 6.13, you must fear the Lord your God and serve him. When you take an oath, you must use his, only his name. You must not worship any of the gods of neighboring nations. King's order, God's order. Which one are you going to believe? Daniel 3.12, we'll find out. But there are some Jews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, whom you have put in charge of the province of Babylon. They pay no attention to you, your majesty. They refuse to serve your gods and do not worship the gold statue you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar flew into a rage in order that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought before him. When they were brought in, Nebuchadnezzar said to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you refuse to serve my gods or to worship the statue I have set up? I will give you one more chance to bow down and worship the statue I have made when you hear the sound of the musical instruments. But if you refuse, you will be thrown immediately into the blazing furnace. And then what God will be able to rescue you from my power? 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is mighty to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you, your majesty, that we will never serve your gods or worship the gold statue you have set up. Their reply, we will not bow down. God will deliver us. They refused to compromise their belief in God or their obedience to him. They didn't look at the size of the furnace or the fiery blast. They didn't listen to the threat or the fear of death. They looked at how big their God was. They were fully convinced of God's promises. They saw themselves as more than big enough through the eyes of faith. They trusted God to be with them through the fire ordeal. Are you bigger than the circumstances? I'm going to talk about Elisha. First, I'm going to give you some background to this before we go into the scriptures. Elisha was telling the king of Israel the battle strategy of the king of Amran. Israel and Amran were at war with each other, and Elisha was telling the king of Israel everything that the other king had planned because God was telling Elisha. So the king of Aram wanted to kill Elisha, and so Elisha had run away from him, and he and his servant were in another city. And we're going to pick up the story at 2 Kings 6.14. So one night the king of Amran sent a great army with many chariots and horses to around the city. When the servant of the man of God got up early the next morning and went outside, there were troops, horses, chariots, everywhere. Oh, sir, what will we do? The young man cried to Elisha. Okay. So this is what the young man saw. He saw all these horses all around them. And he was afraid. Elisha's reaction to all this, 2 Kings 6.16. Don't be afraid, Elisha told him, for there are more on our side than are theirs. Then Elisha prayed, O God, open his eyes and let him see. The Lord opened the young man's eyes, and when he looked up, he saw that the hillside around Elisha was filled with horses and chariots of fire. Elisha didn't look at the armies in the natural. He, didn't, he knew they were there. But he saw beyond them to what his servant couldn't see. He looked at the armies of God. He trusted in God to deliver him. He looked at the size of God's armies, not the enemy's army. How about Paul? Paul was being sent to Rome to stand before Caesar. And on his way, Acts 27, 20 says, A terrible storm raged for many days, blotting out the star and the sun, until at last all hope was gone. So Paul was a prisoner in the ship, bound for Rome to bring him to Caesar. And a fierce storm has ridden and threatened to destroy the boat and drown them all. And the, the sailors were afraid. They were starting to throw things overboard, and trying to escape on lifeboat and everything else. They were just very, very frightened because they were looking at the storm. Paul's reaction, on the other hand, in Acts 27, 21, no one had eaten for a long time. Finally, called the, Paul called the crew together and said, men, you should have listened to me in the first place. I told you so. Not left Crete. You would have avoided all this damage and loss. But take courage. None of you will lose your lives, even though the ship will go down. For last night, an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I serve stood beside me. And he said, Don't be afraid, Paul, for you will surely stand trial before Caesar. What's more, God in his goodness has granted safety to everyone sailing with you. So take courage, for I believe God. It will be just as he said. Paul didn't look at the storm of the circumstances. He looked at the promise of God. And how about you? What are you facing? Are you facing bills? Are you looking at your paycheck? Or are you looking at God's promises? First Philippians 4.19, And the same God who takes care of me will supply all your needs from his glorious riches, which have been given to us in Christ Jesus. Which is bigger in your eyes? Sickness. Are you looking at the illness or God's word? Are you listening to the evil reports or to God's voice? 1 Peter 2.24, He himself bore our sins in his own body on the tree, that dying to sins we might live to righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. God is bigger than any promise you face. Hebrews 4.16 says, Therefore let us boldly come to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jeremiah 32, 17 says, Ah, Lord Jehovah, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and stretched out arm. Nothing is too great for you. 
Your problems may be massive to you, but your God is mighty. The sun will fail to shine sooner than his word will fall to the ground. No matter how big your problems are, he has a promise. Who is God? He is the God of might who created the world by his word. He is the God of wisdom who makes a way in the wilderness. He is the God of tenderness who carries his children home. And he is bigger than all of your problems. And God in us is greater than anything we may face because greater is he that in us than he that is in the world. So how do you see yourself? As big as a grasshopper? Or as God sees you as more than a conqueror in Romans 8.31? as more than big enough through him to defeat every giant in your life, Philippians 4.13. Ephesians 3.20 says that God's mighty power is at work in us. Well, that kind of power in you, you are far bigger than anything that comes against you. Do you see yourself as a grasshopper? Are you kidding me? Do you know who you serve? Do you know who you belong to? You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. You are way bigger than anything that comes at you. Just look at it through the eyes of faith. The God inside of you is way bigger than any giant that can come your way. Father, I thank you that the greater is he that is in us and he that is in the world. That no matter, Father, what comes against us, be it sickness, be it any kind of enemy that might come our way, you are more than enough, Father God. And with you, we are more than enough. Thank you, Father God, that you have infused us with boldness, with strength, with grace, Father, to stand before anything that come our way. And we give you praise, Father God, and we choose, Father, to listen to you instead of the report of the enemy. And we thank you for this, sir, in Jesus' name.